Glad you joined us for our service in which we honor and remember Dr. Martin Luther King through some of his words. We are a welcoming congregation, which means we welcome all. And as part of our social justice work and care for the environment, we are a green sanctuary congregation. Stay connected. Since everything is virtual these days, you can stay connected. Look for opportunities by visiting our website or visiting us on Facebook. You will hear readings by congregation members from some of Dr. King's speeches. Note that the sermon is a reading in five parts from when Dr. King spoke to the Unitarian Universalists at their General Assembly in 1966. Do you know what Dr. King's last request was? You'll discover that answer during the last minute of this video.
I have been disappointed with the white church and its leadership. Of course, there are some notable exceptions. But despite these notable exceptions, I must honestly reiterate that I have been disappointed with the church. I do not say that as one of those negative critics who can always find something wrong with the church. I say it as a minister of the gospel who loves the church, who is nurtured in its bosom, who has been sustained by its spiritual blessings, and who will remain true to it as long as the cord of life shall lengthen. I had the strange feeling when I was suddenly catapulted into the leadership of the bus protest in Montgomery several years ago that we would have the support of the white church. I felt that the white ministers, priests, and rabbis of the South would be some of our strongest allies. Instead, some few have been outright opponents, refusing to understand the freedom movement and misrepresenting its leaders. All too many others have been more cautious than courageous and have remained silent behind the anesthetizing security of stained glass windows. I have heard numerous religious leaders of the South call upon their worshipers to comply with a desegregation decision because it is the law. But I have longed to hear white ministers say, follow this decree because integration is morally right and the Negro is your brother. In the midst of blatant injustices inflicted upon the Negro, I have watched white churches stand on the sidelines and merely mouth pious irreverencies and sanctimonious trivialities. In the midst of a mighty struggle to rid our nation of racial and economic injustice, I have heard so many ministers say, those are social issues which the gospel has nothing to do with. And I have watched so many churches commit themselves to a completely otherworldly religion which made a strange distinction between bodies and souls, the sacred and the secular. I am, I am impelled to mention one, uh, one other point in your statement that troubled me profoundly. You warmly commended the Birmingham police force for keeping order and preventing violence. I wish you had commended the Negro demonstrators of Birmingham for their sublime courage, their willingness to suffer, and their amazing discipline in the midst of the most inhuman provocation. One day the South will recognize its true heroes. One day the South will know that when these disinherited children of God sat down at lunch counters, they were in reality standing up for the best in the American dream and the most sacred values in our Judeo-Christian heritage. Good morning, everyone. It's lovely to be with you today. And I've got a wonder box with me. Have you brought your wondering minds so we can think about what might be in here together? We help each other learn and grow. And I'm shaking this. It's not making any noise at all. So what does that tell you? It's light, no noise. If you have a guess, Tell someone near you what might be in here. I'm going to open it up. Oh, I see some stripes and stars. Yep, it is an American flag. A symbol of our country that means a lot of different things to different people. Let's listen now as we hear the words of Dr. King and what this type of country, this flag represented for him what his dreams were. Let's listen as children, parents, teachers, and volunteers in our religious education program take turns reading. I Have a Dream, speech by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Paintings by Kadir Nelson. 
I say to you today, my friends, that even though we face the difficulties of today and tomorrow, I still have a dream. It is a dream deeply rooted in the American dream. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. I have a dream that one day on the Red Hills of Georgia, the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners will be able to sit down together at the table of brotherhood. I have a dream that one day, even the state of Mississippi, a state sweltering with the heat of injustice, sweltering with the heat of oppression, will be transformed into an oasis of freedom and justice. I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream today. I have a dream that one day little black boys and black girls will be able to join hands with little white boys and white girls as sisters and brothers. I have a dream today. I have a dream that one day every valley shall be exalted, and every hill and mountain shall be made low. The rough places will be made plain, and the crooked places will be made straight, and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. This is our hope. This is the faith that I go back to the South with. With this faith, we will be able to hew out of the mountain of despair a stone of hope. With this faith, we'll be able to transform the jangling discords of our nation into a beautiful symphony of brotherhood. With this faith, we will be able to work together, to pray together, to struggle together, to go to jail together, to stand up for freedom together, knowing that we will be free one day. This will be the day when all of God's children will be able to sing with new meaning. My country tis of thee, sweet land of liberty, of thee I sing. Land where my fathers died, and of the pilgrim's pride, from every mountainside, let freedom ring. And if America is to be a great nation, this must become true. So let freedom ring from the prodigious hilltops of New Hampshire. Let freedom ring from the mighty mountains of New York. Let freedom ring from the heightened Alleghenies of Pennsylvania. Let freedom ring from the snow-capped Rockies of Colorado. Let freedom ring from the curvaceous slopes of California, but not only let freedom ring from Stone Mountain of Georgia. Let freedom ring from Lookout Mountain of Tennessee. Let freedom ring from every hill and low hill of Mississippi. From every mountainside, let freedom ring. And when this happens, when we allow freedom to ring, when we let it ring from every village and hamlet, from every state and every city, we will be able to speed up that day when all God's children, black men and white men, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics, will be able to join hands and sing in the words of the old Negro spiritual, Free at last! Free at last! Thank God Almighty, we are free at last! Thank you to everyone who contributed to our Wonderbox reading today. It was lovely to do that with others. We'll talk more about our dreams and how we can make them real in RE time today. I'll see you then. Bye-bye. We shall hold the calm. We shall hold the calm. We shall hold the calm.
shall all be free. We shall all be free. We shall all be free someday. Oh, deep in my heart, I do believe we shall all be free someday. We shall live in peace. We shall live in peace. We shall live in peace someday. Oh, deep in my heart, I I would like to use as a subject the church remaining awake during a great revolution. I'm sure that each of you has read the arresting little story from the pen of Washington Irving entitled Rip Van Winkle. One thing we usually remember about the story of Rip Van Winkle is that he slept 20 years. But there's another point in that story which is almost completely overlooked. It is a sign on the inn of the little town on the Hudson from which Rip went up into the mountains for his long sleep. When he went up, the sign had a picture of King George III of England. When he came down, the sign had a picture of George Washington, the first president of the United States. When Rip Van Winkle looked up at the picture of George Washington, he was amazed. He was completely lost. He knew not who he was. This incident reveals to us that the most striking thing about the story of Rip Van Winkle is not merely that he slept 20 years, but that he slept through a revolution. While he was peacefully snoring up in the mountain, a revolution was taking place in the world that would alter the face of human history. Yet Rip knew nothing about it. He was asleep. One of the great misfortunes of history is that all too many individuals and institutions find themselves in a great period of change and yet fail to achieve the new attitudes and outlooks that the new situation demands. There is nothing more tragic than to sleep through a revolution. And there can be no gainsaying of the fact that a social revolution is taking place in our world today. We see it in other nations, in the demise of colonialism, 
We see it in our own nation, in the struggle against racial segregation and discrimination. And as we notice this struggle, we are aware of the fact that a social revolution is taking place in our midst. Victor Hugo once said that there is nothing more powerful in all the world than an idea whose time has come. The idea whose time has come today is the idea of freedom and human dignity. And so all over the world, we see something of a freedom explosion. And this reveals to us that we are in the midst of revolutionary times. An old order is passing away and a new order is coming into being. The great question is, what do we do when we find ourselves in such a period? Certainly the church has a great responsibility because when the church is true to its nature, it stands as a moral guardian for the community and society. It has always been the role of the church to broaden horizons, to challenge the status quo, and to question and break mores if necessary. I'm sure that we will all agree that the church has a major role to play in this period of social change. I would like to suggest some of the things that the church must continually do in order to remain awake through this revolution. First, we are challenged to instill within the people of our congregation a world perspective. The world in which we live is geographically one. Now, more and more, we are challenged to make it one in terms of brotherhood. Modern man, through his scientific genius, has been able to dwarf distance and place time in chains. And our jet planes have compressed into minutes distances that once took weeks, if not months. I think Bob Hope, if I can be a little humorous here, had adequately described this jet age in which we live. He said, it is an age in which it is possible to take a non-stop flight from Los Angeles, California to New York City a distance of about 3,000 miles. He goes on to say that if on taking off in Los Angeles, you develop hiccups, you will hick in Los Angeles and cup in New York City. You know, it is possible because of time differences to take a flight from Tokyo on Sunday morning and arrive in Seattle on the preceding Saturday night. When your friends meet you at the airport and ask you when you left Tokyo, you will have to say, I left tomorrow. Well, this is a bit humorous, but I'm trying to laugh a basic fact into all of us. And it is simply this, that through our scientific genius, we have made of this world a neighborhood. And now, through our moral and ethical commitment, we must make it a brotherhood. We must live together as brothers, or we will perish together as fools. This is a fact of life. No individual can live alone. No nation can live alone. All I'm saying is this that all life is interrelated and somehow we are all tied together. For some strange reason, I can never be what I ought to be until you are what you ought to be. And you can never be what you ought to be until I am what I ought to be. This is the interrelated structure of all reality. John Donne caught it years ago and placed it in graphic terms. No man is an island entire of itself. Every man is a piece of the continent, a part of the main. 
He goes on to say, Any man's death diminishes me because I am involved in mankind. Therefore, sin not to know for whom the bell tolls. It tolls for thee. This realization is absolutely necessary if we are to remain awake in this revolution. Secondly, it is necessary for the church to reaffirm over and over again the essential immorality of racial segregation. Any church which affirms the morality of segregation is sleeping through the revolution. We must make it clear that segregation, whether it's in the public schools, in housing, or in recreational facilities, or in the church itself, is morally wrong and sinful. It is not only sociologically untenable or politically unsound or merely economically unwise, it is morally wrong and sinful. There are many insights in all of the major religious faiths which bring this out. Segregation is evil, to use the thinking of the Jewish philosopher Martin Buber, because it substitutes an I-it relationship for an I-thou relationship. According to St. Thomas Aquinas, segregation is wrong because it is based on human laws, which are out of harmony with the moral, the natural, the eternal laws of the universe. Paul Tillich great Protestant theologian who died some months ago, said that sin is separation. What is segregation but an affirmation of man's tragic estrangement, his terrible separation, his awful sinfulness? So over and over again, we must make it clear that we are through with this unjust system now henceforth and forevermore. There is another thing that the church must do to remain awake. I think it is necessary to refute the idea that there are superior and inferior races. We must get rid of the notion once and for all that there are superior and inferior races. <coughs> It is out of this notion that the whole doctrine of white supremacy came into being, and the church must make a stand through religious education and other channels to direct the popular mind at this point, for there are some people who still believe this strange doctrine. Now, fortunately, I'm sure you don't have any Unitarian Universalists who believe this, but I think some of my Baptist brothers around the South believe it, and I would like to get you to help me out with some of my brothers. It's a strange notion that is made for a great deal of strife and suffering. Both the academic world and the disciplines of science have refuted this idea. Anthropologists like Ruth Benedict Margaret Mead and Herskovitz, after long years of study, have made it clear that they find no evidence for the idea of superior and inferior races. There may be superior and inferior individuals in every race, but no superior or inferior races. In spite of this, the notion still lingers around. Now, there was a time that people tried to justify it on the basis of the Bible. Strange, indeed, how individuals will often use, or should I say misuse, the Bible to crystallize the patterns of the status quo and justify their prejudices. So from some pulpits, it was argued that the Negro was inferior by nature 
because of Noah's curse upon the children of Ham. The apostles' dictum often became a watchword. Servants, be obedient to your master. One brother had probably read the logic of the great philosopher Aristotle. You know, Aristotle did a great deal to bring into being what we know now in philosophy as formal logic. And formal logic has a big word known as a syllogism, which has a major premise, a minor premise, and a conclusion. So this brother decided to put his argument of the inferiority of the Negro in the framework of an Aristotelian syllogism. He came out with his major premise, all men are made in the image of God. Then came his minor premise, God, as everybody knows, is not a Negro. Therefore, the Negro is not a man. This was the kind of reasoning that prevailed. Now, on the whole, I guess we have gotten away from this. Most people don't use the Bible and religion to justify segregation, although there are a few left. I was reading the other day where one of our white brothers in Mississippi said that God was a charter member of the White Citizens Council. Today's arguments are generally placed on more subtle cultural grounds. For instance, the Negro is not culturally ready for integration. If you integrate the schools and other areas of life, this will pull the race back a generation. And another, the Negro is a criminal. You see, he has the highest crime rate in any city. So the arguments go on ad infinitum. Those who use these arguments never say that if there are lagging standards in the Negro community, and there certainly are, they lag because of segregation and discrimination. They never go on to say that criminal responses are environmental and not racial. <coughs> <clears throat> Poverty, ignorance, economic deprivation, social isolation, breed crime in any racial group. It is a tortuous logic to use the tragic results of segregation as an argument for the continuation of it. It is necessary to go to the causal route to deal with the problem. So it is necessary for the church, through all of its channels of education and through all of its work, to guide the popular mind and rid the community of the notion of superior and inferior races. We've all seen enough to refute this idea. We've seen Negroes who have given inspiring examples of ability to rise above the shackles of a difficult environment. They have justified the conviction of the poet that, quote, fleecy locks and black complexion cannot forfeit nature's claim. Skin may differ, but affection dwells in black and white the same. If I were so tall as to reach the pole or to grasp the ocean at a span, I must still be measured by my soul, the mind is the standard of the man. The next thing that the church must do to remain awake through this revolution is to move out into the arena of social action. It is not enough for the church to work in the ideological realm and to clear up misguided ideas. To remain awake through this social revolution the church must engage in strong action programs to get rid of the last vestiges of segregation and discrimination. It is necessary to get rid of one or two myths if we're really going to engage in this kind of action program. One is the notion that legislation is not effective in bringing about the changes 
that we need in human relations. This argument says that you've got to change the heart in order to solve the problem. That you can't change the heart through legislation. They would say you've got to do that through religion and education. Well, there's some truth in this. Before we can solve these problems, men and women must rise to the majestic heights of being obedient to the unenforceable. I would be the first to say this. If we are to have a truly integrated society, white persons and Negro persons and members of all groups must live together, not merely because the law says it, but because it's natural and because it's right. But that does not make legislation less important. It may be true that you can't legislate integration, but you can legislate desegregation. It may be true that morality cannot be legislated, but behavior can be regulated. It may be true that the law cannot change the heart, but it can restrain the heartless. The law cannot make a man love me, but it can restrain him from lynching me. And I think that's pretty important also. And so while the law may not change the hearts of men, it does change the habits of men. So it is necessary for the church to support strong, meaningful civil rights legislation. Fortunately, we have seen some real advances at this point. It is very consoling to me, and I know to all of us, the role which all of the major denominations within the Protestant, the Catholic, and the Jewish faiths played in the achievement of the Civil Rights Bill of 1964 the Voting Rights Bill of 1965. We struggled in Selma, Alabama, and in a real sense we developed right there in that little town something that the councils of the world have not been able to develop, a real ecumenical movement. Protestants, Catholics, and Jews stood in Selma, and in a beautiful and meaningful way that was the ecumenical movement which created the Voting Rights Bill. That bill is a tribute to persons like James Reeb, Mrs. Viola Liuzzo, and Jimmy Lee Jackson, those who died and suffered to make it possible. The second myth that we must deal with is that of exaggerated progress. Certainly we've made progress in race relations. And I think we all can glory that the things are better today than they were 10 years ago or even three years ago. We should be proud of the steps we've made to rid our nation of that great evils of racial segregation and discrimination. On the other hand, we must realize that the plant of freedom is but a bud and not yet a flower. The Negro is freer in 1966, but he is not yet free. The Negro knows more dignity today than he has known in any other period in his history in this country, but he is not yet equal. There are still stubborn, difficult problems to deal with all over the country. I'm appalled that some people feel that the civil rights struggle is over because we have a 1964 civil rights bill with 10 titles and a voting rights bill. Over and over again, people ask, what else do you want? They feel that everything is all right. Well, let them look around at our big cities. I can mention one that we are working with now, not to say that it's the worst city in the United States, but just to reveal the problem that we now face. Take a city like Chicago. 
It's a prototype of all our major urban ghettos. There we find 90% of the Negro children of Chicago are in schools with 92% of children of their own race, which means that the schools are almost 100% segregated. Facilities are inadequate in all of those ghetto schools. Chicago spends $266 per pupil in the predominantly Negro schools when they spend $368 in predominantly white schools. In the suburbs, it spends as much as $780 per pupil. This is a real problem. Then in the area of housing, it is estimated that between 36 and 49% of the Negro families of Chicago live in deteriorated housing conditions. 97% of Negro families in Chicago live in what we refer to sociologically as the ghetto. That is 97% of the Negroes live only with Negroes. They are isolated from the mainstream, the total life of the community. In the economic area, the problem is even more serious. Chicago has one of the lowest rates of unemployment of any major city in the United States. It's 2.6%. But when you go to the Negro community, the unemployment rate, which includes only people who once had jobs, is about 10%. If you include those who never held jobs, about 13% of the Negro labor force is unemployed. If the whole of Chicago confronted in unemployment what the Negro is confronting, there would be a staggering depression, worse than any that this country has ever known. So the Negro in his own life is confronting a major depression. This is true of every major city in the United States. While there's great affluence all around, there's still stubborn depths of poverty, deprivation, and despair. The average white high school dropout in Chicago earns more than the average Negro college graduate. Again, this is true in cities all over the country. These are stubborn, difficult problems and yet they are problems that must be tackled. For I need not remind you of the dangers inherent therein. There is nothing more dangerous than to build a society with a large segment of individuals within that society who feel that they have no stake in it, who feel that they have nothing to lose. These are the people who will riot. These are the people who will turn their ears from pleas of nonviolence. For the health of our nation, these problems must be solved. In the areas of housing, schooling, and unemployment, there is still a great deal that must be done. We've come a long, long way we still have a long, long way to go. And action programs are necessary. I've heard it said that the day of demonstration is over. This is something that we hear a great deal. Well, I'm sorry, I disagree with that. I wish I could say that the day of demonstration is over but as long as these problems are with us, it will be necessary to demonstrate in order to call attention to them. I'm not saying that a demonstration is going to solve the problems of poverty, the problem of housing, the problems that we face in our schools. It's going to take something more than a demonstration, but at least the demonstration calls attention 
to it. At least the demonstration creates a kind of constructive crisis that causes the community to see there's a problem and causes the community to working toward the point of acting on it. The church must support this kind of demonstration. As the days unfold, I'm sure that we will need this more. Now, let me say that I am still convinced that nonviolent is the most potent weapon available to oppressed people for their struggle for freedom and human dignity. And I'd like to say a word about this philosophy as it is the underlying philosophy of our movement. It has power because it has a way of disarming the opponent. It exposes his moral defenses and it weakens his morale. And at the same time, it works on his heart and on his conscience and he just doesn't know what to do. If he doesn't hit you, wonderful. If he hits you, develop the courage, the quiet courage of accepting blows without retaliating. If he doesn't put you in jail, that's very nice. Nobody with any sense loves to go to jail. But if he puts you in jail, go in jail and transform it from a dungeon of shame into a haven of freedom and human dignity. Even if he tries to kill you, you develop the inner conviction that there are some things so precious, some things so eternally true that they're worth dying for. If a man has not discovered something that he will die for, he is not fit to live. There's another good thing about nonviolence. Through it, a person can use moral means to procure moral ends. There are still those who sincerely believe that the end justifies the means, no matter what the means happen to be, no matter how violent, how deceptive, or anything else they are. Nonviolence at its best would break with the system that argues that. Nonviolence would say that the morality of the ends is implicit in the means, and that in the long run, a history of destructive means cannot bring constructive ends. So since we are working together for a just society in this movement, we should use just methods to get there. Since we are working for an end that is a nonviolent society in this movement, we must use nonviolent means to get there. Since we are working for an integrated society as an end, we must work on an integrated basis on our staff and our civil rights organizations so that we don't get to racial justice and integration through the means of black nationalism. Another thing about this philosophy, which is often misunderstood, that it says that at its best, the love ethic can be a reality in our social revolution. Most revolutions in the past have been based on hope and hate with the rising expectations of the revolutionaries implemented by hate for the perpetrators of the unjust system in the old order. I think the different thing about the nonviolent revolution that has taken place in our country is that it has maintained a hope element while adding a dimension of love. Now, many people would disagree with me and say that love hasn't been there. I think we have to stop and talk, talk about what we mean in this context, because I would be the first to say that it is nonsense to urge people, oppress people, to love their violent oppressors in an affectionate sense. 
And I certainly am not talking about that when I talk about love standing at the center of our struggle. I think it's necessary to see the meaning of love uh, in higher terms. The Greek language has three words for love, eros, philios, and agape. I'm not thinking of arrows or of friendship as expressed in the word philios, but of the word agape. Agape, which is understanding, creative, redemptive goodwill for all men, an overflowing love which seeks nothing in return. When one rises to this level of love, he loves a person who does the evil deed but hates the deed. I believe that in our best moments in this struggle, we have tried to adhere to this. In some strange way, we have been able to stand up in the face of our most violent opponents and say, in substance, we will match your capacity to inflict suffering with our capacity to endure suffering. We will meet your physical force with our soul force. Do to us what you will, and we will love you. We cannot in all good conscience obey your unjust laws because non-cooperation with evil is as much of a moral obligation as cooperation with good. Throw us in jail, and we will love you. Threaten our children, bomb our homes, send your hooded perpetrators into our neighborhoods at midnight hours. Drag us out on some wayside road and beat us and leave us half dead. And as difficult as it is, we will love you. Send your propaganda agents around the nation and make it appear that we are not fit morally, culturally, or otherwise for integration and we will still love you. But be assured that we will wear you down because of our capacity to suffer. And one day we will win our freedom. We will not only win freedom for ourselves, we will so appeal to your heart and conscience that we will win you in the process and our victory will be a double victory this is our message in a nonviolent movement when we are true to it. I think it is a powerful method and I still believe in it. I know that it will lead us into a new day, not a day when we will seek to rise from a position of disadvantage to advantage, thereby subverting justice, not a day when we will substitute one tyranny for another. We know that the doctrine of black supremacy is as evil as that of white supremacy. We know that God is interested, not interested merely in the freedom of black men or brown men or yellow, but that God is interested in the freedom of the whole human race. He's interested in the creation of society where all men will live together as brothers and every man will respect the dignity and the worth of human personality. With the nonviolent method guiding us on, we can go in and go on to that brighter day when justice will come. I talk a great deal about the need for a kind of divine discontent. And I always mention that there are certain technical words within every science which become stereotypes and cliches. Modern psychology has a word that has become common. It is the word maladjusted. We read a great deal about it. It is a ringing cry of modern child psychology. And certainly we all want to live well-adjusted and avoid neurotic and schizophrenic personalities. But I must say to you, my friends, there are some things in our nation and in our world to which I am proud to be maladjusted. And I call upon you to be maladjusted, and all people of goodwill to be maladjusted, 
to these things until a good society is realized. I never intend to adjust myself to segregation and discrimination. I never intend to become adjusted to religious bigotry. I never intend to adjust myself to economic conditions that will take necessities from the many to give luxuries to the few and leave millions of people perishing on a lonely island of poverty in the midst of a vast ocean of prosperity. I must honestly say, however much criticism it brings, that I never intend to adjust myself to the madness of militarism and to the self-defeating effects of physical violence. In a day when Sputniks and Geminis are dashing through outer space, and ballistic missiles are carving highways of death through the stratosphere, no nation can win a war. It is no longer a choice between nonviolence and violence. It is now a choice between nonviolence and non-existence. The alternative to disarmament under a strong UN the alternative to a suspension of nuclear tests. The alternative to a negotiated settlement in Vietnam and the point of coming to that condition of not bombing the North. The alternative to admitting China may well be a civilization plunged into the abyss of annihilation. In our earthly habitat can be transformed into an inferno that even the mind of Dante could not imagine. Yes, I must confess that I firmly believe that our world is in dire need of a new organization. The International Association for the Advancement of Creative Maladjustment. Men and women as maladjusted as the prophet Amos, who in the midst of the injustices of his day, cried out in words that echo across the centuries. Let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. As maladjusted as Abraham Lincoln, who had the vision to see that this nation could not survive half slave and half free. As maladjusted as Thomas Jefferson, who in the midst of an age amazingly adjusted to slavery, cried in words lifted to cosmic proportions, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. As maladjusted as Jesus of Nazareth, who could say to the men and women of his day, he who lives by the sword will perish by the sword. Through such maladjustment, we will be able to emerge from the bleak and desolate midnight of man's inhumanity to man into the bright and glittering daybreak of freedom and justice. Let me say in conclusion that I have not despaired of the future. I believe firmly that we can solve this problem. I know that there are still difficult days ahead, and they are days of glorious opportunity. Our goal for America is freedom. Abused and scorned, though we may be, our destiny is tied up with America's. Before the Pilgrim Fathers landed at Plymouth, we were here. Before Jefferson etched across the pages of history the words that I just quoted from the Declaration of Independence, we were here. Before the beautiful words of the Star-Spangled Banner were written, we were here. For more than two centuries, our forebears labored here without wages. They made cotton king. They built the homes of their masters in the midst of the most oppressive and humiliating conditions. And yet, out of a bottomless vitality, they continued to grow and develop. If the inexpressible cruelties of slavery couldn't stop us, the opposition that we now face will surely fail. We're going to win our freedom because both the sacred heritage of our nation 
and the eternal will of the Almighty God are embodied in our echoing demands. And we can sing, we shall overcome, because somehow we know the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. We shall overcome because Carlyle is right. No lie can live forever. We shall overcome because William Cullen Bryant is right. Truth crushed will rise again. We shall overcome because James Russell, Ru Russell Lowell is right. Truth forever on the scaffold, wrong forever on the throne. Yet that scaffold sways the future, and behind the dim unknown standeth God within the shadow, keeping watch above his own. With this faith, we will be able to hew out of the mountain of despair a stone of hope. We will be able to transform the jangling discords of our nation into a beautiful symphony of brotherhood and speed up that day when all God's children all over our nation and the world will be able to walk the earth as brothers and sisters. And then we can sing the words of the old Negro spiritual, free at last, free at last, Thank God Almighty, we are free at last. Thank you. dreary with low hovering clouds of despair, and when our nights become darker than a thousand midnights, let us remember that there is a creative force in this universe working to pull down the gigantic mountains of evil, a power that is able to make a way out of no way and transform dark yesterdays into bright tomorrows. And then I got into Memphis, and some began to say the threats, or talk about the threats that were out. What would happen to me from some of our sick white brothers? Well, I don't know what will happen now. We've got some difficult days ahead, but it really doesn't matter with me, because I've been to the mountaintop, and I don't mind. Like anybody, I would like to live a long life. 
Longevity has its place, but I'm not concerned about that now. I just want to do God's will, and he's allowed me to go up to the mountain. And I've looked over, and I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you, but I want you to know tonight that we as a people will get to the promised land. And I'm happy tonight. I'm not worried about anything. I'm not fearing any man. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord.